Hold on. <laughs> Wait for her to say what? <laughs> you are live. All right. Thank you. Well, good evening, guys. Boy, I love you so much. I'm so thankful for the, you know the work that the Lord's doing, and um, boy, being able to come back and follow up here. We're starting a new book of Ephesians. Uh, get to go over the introduction. I know you guys really like that, <laughs> <laughs> but it does give us an outlay and, and you know of, of what this what the book is about and what it's trying to accomplish for us and stuff. I feel like I got a hair and it's driving me crazy. Uh, so anyhow, it, it, it's it's one of those uh, books. And matter of fact, our Phoenix. Uh, pastor out there has just got done with the book of Ephesians or still in it, I'm not sure. I think he passed it because he's in spiritual gifts now. But, but in any case, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. It, it touches a lot of different things. It touches uh, redemption. It touches, uh, you know, a, a believer's uh, spiritual enlightenment. It also touches the fact of the believer's life, you know, in Christ and the relationship to the domestic believers. You know, in other words, your, your brothers and sisters and everything else. And then, of course, the, the spiritual warfare that the believer is in. And guys, that is a, that is a crucial, crucial war. That, that warfare between the flesh and the spirit. Uh, you know, we used to, all the time we hear that the devil's on one shoulder and the angel's on the other shoulder. And, you know, it makes you go, it isn't like that, but it is kind of the same type of war. It really is. Uh, you know the Spirit, you know what the Spirit says, and, and then we wonder why we're having trouble. And it's because we don't want to listen to what the Spirit says, and this flesh has now been put to death, and the Spirit will, well, the Spirit will always get its way, you know, and so, and that's for our good. So anyhow, I'm looking forward to the book of Ephesians. Uh, special prayer requests this week. Uh, anything on your hearts and minds since Sunday? Christine? Keep, uh, keep praying for the common voice. She, gets, she does have cancer on the middle side of her throat. Connie Boyd? My, my sister in law. Uh, pray for me for Friday. And, pray for uh, me for Friday. Friday. Oh yes. And uh, is, is Tyler still ill? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say pray for him. He's still not feeling well. If all those that are here, if they're yeah, not sure if they're all here, maybe they're all sick. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to pray for Donna. Anyone else? Pray for Donna and, and the situation there with her mother and, and finding a new place for her or whatever the, whatever the Lord wills there. But we'll live Donna up. I want to lift the, the lawyers up to be able to stand up to whatever the re legal requirements are to, to be able to see to it she's protected, you know, in, in, the, in the decision making. And they have one more. Okay. Pray for our pastor. <laughs> Amen. You have a lot of one more. I do, but I have nothing going on, really. Jesus. It's kind of funny because, you know, and I appreciate the prayers, Steve, always to come with your guys' prayers, always, always, always. The pastor in Phoenix, you know, was the same way, you know, uh, he hardly ever asked for anything or anything like that. And, and I often watched what he had to put up with me 
And then I happen to think he's got 200 and some other people he's trying to direct and, you know, lead in the same fashion. And I always wonder, how do you do that? And all he could ever say is, you got to do it in the spirit. You have to do it in the spirit. You can't do it out of any type of judgment. You can't do it out of any type of an emotion or any of those things. You have to lead by the spirit. And so... It sounds easy, guys, but it is, it's a job in itself, it, and it is a warfare, and we're in a spiritual warfare. It's, it's not about the flesh and blood, you know, we might be able to whip our neighbor, you know, but according to God, that's not, what, that's not the warfare we're in. The warfare we're in is a spiritual warfare. Uh, being able to hear Jesus is a wonderful, wonderful gift, but being able to hang on to him is, a, is another war in itself. And because everything in this world tries to pull you away and, and most of your loved ones and your friends and your neighbors and stuff, they, they, that's what it is. It tries to pull you away from it. And it doesn't take very much, guys. And that's why he says we need to be uh, assembled together and, you know, and, and for the protection and for our minds to be set on him. I don't even care if you come and sleep in my class because I know that the spirit will penetrate that that sleep, you know, and stuff. So, and I and I see that in Brother Dwayne. I, I don't know how he can do it, but that young man can sit and listen to uh, a sermon, and you never see him lift his head up. And when you ask him to pray, he hits almost every point that you brought up. And I'm like. He's gifted. I, I can't help it, it but he does. It's wonderful. Yeah, I hope he's doing all right tonight too, with the being wet and rainy. Yeah, and, uh, uh, he's working. He, he's started delivering pizza and what have you guys, and he, he's enjoying it. And he's he feels worthy now. You know, he feels worthy in the aspect of being able to pay tithes and offerings and all the different things. And and you know, he, there's a worth about work. Now that's all there is to it. You know, there is, there is a certain amount of it that, that it really does make us feel worth something. So, anyhow, um, if there's nothing else, more prayer, pray for one another. That's what the Father says. Father, we just come to you at this time, Lord, and boy, we just give you great thanks for assembling us here in your presence, Father. And boy, for all that's been mentioned on our prayer list, Lord, and just ask that you intervene in their lives, one, you know, one for another. And Lord, boy, let your will be done. And boy, Father, let us not fall into the temptation of what we can do or what we could do or couldn't do, but really just see you and keep our eyes focused on you, Lord, and let your work uh, manifest the love from us. Boy, Father, I do just thank you for the opportunity to be able to bring forth this book of Ephesians. Uh, I just love the letters and teachings of Paul and, and boy, what it does for our church bodies throughout our whole world. Father, once again, I thank you in all things. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so the book of Ephesians, guys, it, it's, it's one that Paul had wrote to the Ephesian church and, and his purpose in writing was to, to, to make sure that his people were prayerful, uh, long prayerful, you know, consistent prayerful, uh, uh, so that they could advance in their faith, so that they could advance in love and wisdom in Christ. You know, I, I knew Jesus, but I knew from the very first day that I met him uh, that I needed to know more. And that's probably one of the things that's really kept me so consistent in our Lord churches. I still, even to this day, I need to know more. I need to know more. And, you know, it's not just about, you know, coming through here and getting baptized and this and that. I need to know more. And it's not so much that I need to know more for myself, but I need to know more so that I can share more. And the more you learn of Jesus, the more you have to share with people, and no matter what the situation might be. So, you know, be in prayer for that, you know, so, and then, and then the revelation. That's the other thing that the book of Ephesians is, is really talking about, is that revelation. Uh, 
A revelation means that there was something there that maybe you might have even got a glimpse of, but all of a sudden something came along and it revived you, you know, gave you this revelation of that is the way it is. And so Paul's really uh, good in this very thing here. Uh, his earnest desire is to live a life worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of the things that Paul wants us all to live is a life that's worthy of Jesus and, and you know, what he did there for us. Uh, also, uh, that, you know, by living a life filled with Christ, it will strengthen our faith and give us a solid spiritual foundation. You know, the things that, that we think we stand on, it, the more we build our faith, the more God puts into us, in our ears and into our hearts and minds, the stronger the foundation is. You know, you can pile a bunch of rocks around this building, but the foundation becomes a lot stronger when you put the cement to it, you know. And, and so, anyhow, it's the same thing. And, 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 and in that cement, it shows that fullness of God, you know, when all of a sudden it's all locked together, a physical body is drawn together, and piece by piece God put it in as he sees fit, and then he binds it, and that's what's so beautiful. The binding is, we're just stones. He could have stones, praise him. But the binding is Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus that binds all the stones together and gives it a solid foundation. Without Jesus, that's our cornerstone. Without it, the whole building falls. And so, you know, it's that same foundation that he's talking about. And then the revealing of that uh, has an eternal purpose as well. And what that eternal purpose is, is the redemption. That we, we were bought back by the payment of Christ. We have been bought back, paid in full, redeemed from, from our sins. And the things that separated us from God. And that goes for each and every individual. That goes for the preacher, that goes for the teacher, that goes for the ministers, that goes for anybody, uh, believers. It goes for every one of us. You know, and, and so I want us to understand that though we're individuals, God says that we all have the same Lord and we all have the same spirit. So here's the locking of that joint heirs in Christ and it locks us all together. Uh, not one better than another. So Paul, you know, in his reading there in chapter 1, uh, he's got uh, readings, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then he gets right off into the teaching part of it. And, and he's talking about the, the powerful doctrine. And what he means by that is the powerful words of God and what it does for the believer's redemption. You know, we hear it. Uh, we may even speak about redemption. But do we understand redemption? Do we understand that no matter what comes up against us, that payment has been made full. <coughs> And God didn't miss it. He didn't, he didn't miss a jot or a tittle or anything you'll get into or anything you won't get into. He did not miss it when he took it out on Jesus on the cross. He gathered all the sins of the entire world and made his son that payment for that sin. And then he buried it out of his sight so it won't be sin that will send people out of the heaven. That will not not. Not the physical sin. That's been put away in Christ Jesus. Every sin. The sin that will send you into the abyss is the sin of omission. Taking that gift that God has paid a, a diligent price for a, a redemption and, and trodden it underfoot like it doesn't mean nothing. Like it's not that way. <coughs> so it's about the uh, believer's uh, redemption. And, and the only way that we can really see that redemption, guys, is if we see the, the premises of, of, of Christ. You know, the very essence of Christ and what his purpose was and what he was brought on the face of this earth for and, and, and why he lived that perfect life and, and all the different things. It's in that premise of, of Christ and, and his redemptive work. Uh, also, his preeminence uh, in the Father's plan. In other words, guys, listen, when he was born, he already knew the Father's plan. 
And then Father's plan was to be able to seek to save that that was lost, call them to belief, and then you're going to die on a cross for the sins of humanity. And he knew and he was a part of that plan from the beginning all the way through. And so, you know, that was once again the Father's plan. Uh, his preeminence in uh, the fact of the believer's uh, participation, uh, you know, in that, in that, in that perfect life, guys, uh, he knows that he's he's got the power and the authority through redemption, only through redemption. He has the power and the authority so that the believer can participate in the same wills of the Father. What is the will of the Father? What is it? Seek and save the lost. Seek to save that that's lost. I, I do the, I, I go right to what he has always shared with me. The purpose of the Father is that no man would perish. They all would have eternal life. That's the purpose. And yes, it's going to make you a participant in that if you're going to seek to save that that's lost. Jesus, you know, could have came in and he could have been a baby and I guess God could have threw him up on the cross and, and killed him right there and the payment would have been made full. But he, he lived it out. He, he was a participant of the sinful nature of man. Uh, not that he ever partook of it, but he was always tried in it. He's not a high priest that, that doesn't understand our shortnesses because he was tried in all things like you and I, but he failed not. So he was tried in everything, and, and, and he still lived it to the perfection of God. So it shows that a believer's participation in, in the belief of or following uh, redemption. Uh, it also shows his preeminence in the spirit and how the spirit's application. Uh, yeah, I believe, in, I believe in God. Well, what about the spirit? What are you talking about, spirit? I don't have no ghost. I don't have this. I don't have that. Well, what are you talking about, spirit? Are there, you know, it, there's an application. When you came up out of this water, he promised us something. That when you arose out of this water, he would raise you up in a brand new, uh, forgiven <coughs> soul. And in that, he would place, he would place into you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and so, once again, so what is that spirit enlightenment that God gave you right here? Love. And love. You're right. That's exactly what it is. For the first time in our life, coming up out of these waters... We knew that we were loved by a heavenly Father. God Himself loved us. He paid the price for us right there on the cross. And now everything comes through Jesus and is in Jesus. That's the way it is. The Spirit comes upon us. And so now the believer has, has this very application of God's love. Uh, you can't say that I believe in God, but I don't have the application of His love. I can't love you. I can believe for you and everything else that I can't love you. That would be a sheer lie. Because God has gave us the ability. And, and I know every one of us in our lost state has said that we love somebody. But it isn't until that enlightenment of God's Spirit falls on you that all of a sudden you understand what it is to love somebody. And it's not always as easy as you think. You know, to love somebody is in spite of themselves. That's what Jesus did. In spite of himself, he loved us no matter what. And, and so, same thing for us. And, and so that prayer, uh, his, his prayer is that that believer has that spiritual enlightenment. It is, it is God's love inside of these vessels. Uh, Larry and Christine and Don and, and Amber and and Steve and all the other believers has confessed Jesus as the Lord and Savior. And so, but we have to have that enlightenment. When we hear enlightenment, I'm wondering what we're thinking. He doesn't say, you know, enlightenment. He says enlightenment. You know, the things that come to the light, that light will set you free. And so, when you have that spiritual enlightenment, knowing that God loves you, well, he says it in the scripture, if God be for you, who can be against you? But that's a hard one. 
That's it. That's something that only through that redemption that God gave us through Jesus, guys, that you can live it that way. You can't live it that way any other way. You have to. You have to be able to uh, see that. You know that that enlightenment. All of a sudden, here it is. I was walking through a dark uh, area. I thought I was a good guy. I thought I was doing the best I could. Everything else. Jesus came along. He opened my ears. Let me hear what God had to say to my heart and mind. And I confessed Him as Lord and Savior. His Spirit moved upon me. And now it's enlightened it to a point to where I can share it and make people see that love of God. That's an enlightenment. That's a spiritual enlightenment. And that love is there. Brother Larry said something to me. I used to be quiet. I didn't talk to many people, this and that. But now I find myself talking to people. I find myself talking to them about, you know, God. Uh, 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 loving things, caring things, you know. And, and though he cared with all his heart, it's a different type of love, is it not, Larry? It's, it's something different. Uh, it's, it's that enlightenment of him and, and, and what it's about. So, you know, what is the results of the redemption in Christ? That's another point that Paul brings up here. What is, what is the results of a redemption in Christ Jesus? Well, one of the results is reconciling us to, uh, to others who are being saved. In that work that he did, he reconciled me to, to Brother Larry. He reconciled me to Brother Steve. He reconciled me to this lost and dying world. To, to, to do what? To, you know, for them to be saved. Something else. It releases us from sin and death unto a new life in Christ Jesus. That's what this, that's what this whole redemption stuff in Christ is all about. It releases you from the sin. And it releases you from that pain of sin, which is death. Death meaning, that's my phone, sorry. Death meaning, uh, that death meaning separation from God. You know, and, he, and to a new life in Christ Jesus. What is that new life? Well, it's everlasting. It's a redemptive life. You know. It also does something else. It unites us uh, in Christ, guys. I get it. I've seen it. Stop. I'm going on. I'm not okay. going to stop. I'm sorry. I've been interrupted by the internet too many times. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know what the record button is. That's the sad part. Anyhow. Yeah, but it reunites us to Christ. And it reunites us to Christ not in what we think is. You know, we see, we see Baptists and we see Catholic and we see Protestant and we see Presbyterian, and we see, you know, all the other religions. But that is not what, that's not what this uh, uh, work that God's done has, it didn't separate us from that. We are supposed to be one-minded. I don't, I don't care how you want to title yourself. You were a sinner. You were fallen away from the grace of God. If you had died in that penalty, you have been cast out away from him, dead, without a relationship. And I don't care if you want to tag yourself as different beliefs. Uh, if you, you know, God done that too for some reason. But in all reality, you know, what it is, is it's, it's we have been now through this, through this redemption of Christ. It ignites us in Christ to one household. What household did he unite us into? What do you got? That's it. He united us into one household. What is that household? The church. The church, uh, the body of Christ, uh, the, the kingdom of God. You know, we listen guys, if we all get out of here, we're going to be in one house. And that house is going to be in the kingdom of God. Is that right? But it it, it, it it unites us in Christ in one household. And that household is the kingdom of God. That's where we're all wanting to get. I don't care if you're Catholic, I don't care if you're Baptist, I don't care if what you are, your whole goal, guys, is to make it to the kingdom of God. 
And, and that's one of the things that this redemption in Christ Jesus has done for us. We will make it to the kingdom of God if we stay united to the household of Christ, which is the church. You know, uh, it reveals that God's wisdom, and the only place that it reveals God's wisdom is in the church. It doesn't reveal it out there. If it was, it could be found out of a tree, or it could be found out of an animal, or it could be found out of here or there. That some people say, well, no, I, I see my aunt talk to me, to me. Uh, I see her in the wall, or I see this or that. That is not how it happens. And how it happens is the only way to come to God's wisdom, guys, is in the church. I could not teach and preach and do the things that I do if I wasn't raised up in the wisdom of the church, which is God. And, and it unites every one of us. And, you know, and for some of you, you see me for a period of time here. My daughter has seen this all throughout my life. You know, and, it, and, 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 I, and I've had my roller coaster rides too, you know. But it always stayed founded in the household of Christ. Uh, it's pretty, it's a wonderful thing to hear your kids say, uh, you know, I just wish I could go back to my childhood. And the reason that they wish they could go back to their childhood is they were always in that security of the body of Christ. And we did everything together with the church. You know, we said everything. I mean, when we go do something, if we wanted to have fun with one another, if we wanted to, uh, you know, go and go to the mall or do this or that, we didn't go out and gather strangers, you know. We gathered our neighbors, which most of our neighbors were saved. And most of them was going to our local church. So we would gather together and we'd run into uh, town and do whatever we needed to do. And so that wisdom, though, came from the church. It didn't come from any other way. It comes from that household of God. Uh, uh, the next thing that Paul brings up there in, in the first part of the chapter 1 through it's actually in the first three chapters of Ephesians, is uh, his prayer for the believer's spiritual fulfillment. Now, it's one thing to be the believer, but to have the spiritual fulfillment is when all of a sudden you're so full of it, <laughs> and that's the, probably not the right way to put it, but you're so full of it that it's so fulfilling that it starts shedding over onto others. All of a sudden, you start seeing that fulfillment of God's love and correction and direction and this and that. And, and you're able to overcome the things that you were never able to overcome before because you didn't have that fulfillment of God's love for you. I don't care what goes on, guys. Listen, God loves us. You know, and, and you can't come to me and say, well, but you don't understand I've done this and that's against God and I can't be a part of it. You don't know. God says we're all just alike. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has come short of His glory. Every one of us has crossed over transgressions, He says. Every one of us has had iniquities in our life. God says it's this way. We twist it to make it our way. And God's. Sometimes. Sometimes. But that's, what, that's really what He's trying to share is he wants us to have that fulfillment. It's so full, when your cup is full, it overflows. You keep adding to it, and it will overflow, guys. You keep adding to the, the Word of God into those vessels, and I guarantee you, you will not be able to keep it to yourself. It won't happen. Because when situations come up, and this and that, where's the overflow? What is the overflow? What are they lacking? You know, if they've stepped away a little bit, what they're lacking is that, that fulfillment of, of that love of God. And it's not for us to get into their issues one way or the other. It's to really bring them back to the fulfillment that, look, you know what? You're, you're fine in Christ Jesus. You know? And you're like, well, that makes it too simple. No, no. That's one of the hardest things that you'll ever do is keep this mind the subdued into the spirit of Christ. One of the hardest things you'll ever do in your life, guys. Everybody thinks, well, you come to Jesus and life is just a bowl of cherries from that. Mm. No, it's not. Not according to these scriptures. 
not according to the life and letters of Paul. It's quite the contrary. It, it, it's a spiritual battle. Uh, next thing he brings up in chapters 4 through 6 is he brings up uh, practical instruction. And that practical instruction is for the believer's life. It's practical to be a part of the body of Christ. It's practical to follow God's ordinances, tithes and offerings, Lord's Supper, you know, uh, seeking to save that that's lost. Those things are practical. But what's, what he's talking about, guys, is to be able to put that practical uh, life of God into the believer's new life. You know, that, you know, that wasn't practical before, but now it is. Now it's in your life, and that Jesus is in there, and it's a new life. So you can't, sorry, you can't base it on what you do from even times past. Why? That's dead. Huh? Because you live something different. Because you live something different, but why else, guys? Because it's and dead. In fulfillment of Christ, why can you not live it from what you do from past? Because it's dead. You were baptized. You're a new creation. You ain't supposed to be living the past. And, and, and you're dead how many times? Over and over as long as you keep coming to Christ. Okay. And, and so what I'm trying to share with you is you can't carry yesterday because that's dead and gone, but it's a brand new day in Christ Jesus. How are you going to live you know, are you going to live it? That's the way it is. Or are you going to say, well, I know, but yesterday, God didn't, God didn't, that's, that's already done. That you cannot, and don't worry about tomorrow because it has its own problems. You know, if you start worrying about tomorrow, the future, maybe you won't make it till tomorrow. So all that worry was for what? Yeah, because it's called the past. You can't change it. It's already happened. But what are you going to do now? Yeah. And so what it does is it shows the believer has a new life. And that new life is due every single day. I know the message this last Sunday was in a, I found so many different things after preaching it that, uh, that could have been applied and everything else. But the thing that really touched my heart so much is how God really made us get up and see that for us, you are who you are. And so when you get up in the morning, even if you get out of bed grumpy, sooner or later, you're going to hit the mirror. And when you hit that mirror, if you're seeing anything other than the image of Christ, you need to go back to bed and start over and get back down there and see what you see. Because it is that, it is that real. You know, if I look in the mirror and see Bush, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to have a butch day, which is not a Christ day. And so what happens if I look in there and say, well, you're looking good to the Father today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, what type of an attitude is that going to change? What is that going to make you feel like? And, and you're not basing it off of yesterday, what you do yesterday. You're not basing it off of what you do to, uh, tomorrow because you ain't made it to the mirror tomorrow. Uh, what what's standing right in front of you? Remember the old cross this, that we brought up? If that's what we see in the morning, when we look into the mirror or anything, listen, are you going to say God doesn't make you the most beautiful thing in the world? And the reason you're so beautiful is why? Because of the fulfillment of His love in that vessel. And so it's either going to produce that great love all day long, or it's going to produce whoever you see, whoever you are. That's what it's going to produce. And 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 guys, listen, those those messages are not just to be heard. Those messages are to set in. And I guarantee you, there's those that got to hear that on Sunday. I guarantee you, sometime they walked to the mirror and looked in that mirror and laughed because that's like. I know I'm supposed to be seeing Jesus, but I still see me. And so what are you supposed to do? What would it make you do if you really seen you in the midst of all of it? What should you do? Pray. Pray. And what, what does that mean to do? 
Wait, what does that mean? That, okay, I see me and I don't know, uh, so I'm going to pray. But what does that bring into the realm? What, what does that bring into that picture? Communication. Huh? Communication. Communication with who? Jesus. The man in the, the, man in the mirror? No. Or? Jesus. It would be like David when David just said, Lord, please change his heart. Change his heart, yes. The same thing, guys. And, and if we start, even those little bitty specks of that, if we would start applying those things into our life, and in the morning getting up and saying, well, God says I'm perfect, holy, and blameless, let me see who I see. And if that, if that face that's looking at you doesn't tell you you're perfect, holy, and blameless, you need to rebuke it. And rebuke it in the Spirit of God. Because there's, I mean, how else are you going to, church, I'm not making a judgment. What are you going to live if you don't see Christ first thing in the morning? Me, myself, and I. Me, mine, I. All day long. Even if you don't want to, that's what you're going to see. And it isn't until all of a sudden, either that fulfillment of the Spirit comes back and says, man, I should have just listened to that stupid message. I should have just woke up and seen myself as a child of God, perfect, holy, and blameless, and nothing can come against me because God says He's for me. There'd be a there'd be an awful lot of change in our lives. There would be a whole different realm in our life and those around us just as well. It really would. And, and I challenge us to try I challenge you to get up. I know Brother Steve. Uh, you know, I was telling him, every morning I get up before my feet hit the floor, I thank God for another day of His grace and mercy. I'm awake and I'm not in a heavenly place. I'm not there yet. So I thank God every morning before my feet hit the floor. Now, <laughs> Steve says sometimes he has to go to the bathroom. So he tries to run to the bathroom and then he wants to go back and sit on the bed with his feet off the floor. But he said he tried that one morning and kicked the bed. <laughs> I've been trying to live that lesson. <laughs> he kicked that bed that made him sit right down on the edge of the bed. <laughs> you know? And then he remembered what you got to do. And get up in the morning in Jesus Christ Church. Get up in the morning in Christ Jesus. Get up alive. Get up fulfilled in the Spirit of God. Otherwise, it's going to be filled with... <laughs> with your mom and everything else and you got these lawyers and everything else I don't know but God I know that you know and you'll give me the, the knowledge that I need to have and, and what's what's it's going to produce a lot more than the word and the tears and all the other things and God comes along guys he drives your tears there won't be no tears in heaven you know there won't be no pain in heaven there won't be no worry in heaven. And brings up the next one. A believer's new life in practical instruction is in harmony with God and the purpose is for the church. You know, how can you, you know, if all our churches is a bunch of sourpusses, it's not going to go very well if you're trying to bring new people in that's already got that in their life and you're trying to show them there's a difference in Christ Jesus. I mean, we got to, we got to live as children of God, amen? Amen. My goodness. You know, and, and it shows that you're in harmony with God. You're not in harmony with the situation. You're not in harmony with what somebody else wants you to be. You're in harmony with God. You're the you, Lord, I'm just resting in you. Whatever you bring my day, I'm going to deal with it the best way I know, and that's in your love, faith in Jesus Christ. That's the warfare that Paul talks about that we're in every single day, guys. We're in that. You get out of that bed in the morning, you're in a warfare immediately with which way you're going to live it. Immediately. Am I, am I lying? Mm -mm. 
you wake up somebody in your ear just tearing it up, man, the first thing I'm there is like, oh, Lord, let me pray for that. You know? And then I'll get to me, but that needs to be taken care of first. So anyhow, that, that, that very instruction, and it's an instruction for our believer's life, it, it, and it does something else. It brings a new life to you because now all of a sudden it brings the life of purity. And guys, it brings the life of purity. Perfect, holy. As, you know, you're perfect, holy, and blameless, guys. That brings purity. And if you're perfect, what do you add to perfection? If you're holy, that means you've been set aside by somebody else, the work of the Holy Spirit, to be made what? To be made perfect. You know, blameless. You know, so, so it, it, it gives you a new life in purity. You know, I'm perfect, guys. Listen, I, I'm, I'm going to have my blemishes. I'm going to have my troubles. I'm going to have everything else. But Jesus had all that stuff, too. They searched high and low for him to kill him. That's all they ever wanted to do from the day he was conceived, or born actually, not conceived, but born. The minute that king heard that there was one, you know, uh, he wanted, who is it? You know, where is this baby? And all he wanted to do was kill him. So he lived, uh, you know, uh, so then now by living in a new life of purity, don't we live also as living as children of light instead of children of darkness? Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Yes, I do. I know that that stuff right there will kill you one day if you don't get that to Christ Jesus and get forgiven of. I do know. I know that that will kill you one day if you don't get it to Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, and so listen, and not in the physical sense, that it will kill you because all of a sudden you'll find yourself being separated from the love of God. The love of God. Yes, you're right. We live as children of light. We don't live as children of darkness. We don't have to cover up our faith in Jesus Christ. We don't. That's a lot. Living as a children of light, uh, it says, uh, careful and spirit-filled. Being careful. You know, you can shove the light of Jesus down people's throat. And we used to call it Bible dumping. Where you take the Word of God and beat somebody with it. And guys, you can do that. But that's not. No, God says, do it careful. And do it careful at with being filled in the Spirit. Again, be careful, filled in what? The Spirit. I want to hear the other word. Love. Love. Be careful. And be filled in love. Every morning. Every day. All the time. Uh, then what that leads to, once we've got ourselves maybe in in realms of the Spirit of God and being His child, and we don't we don't need anything. God's going to provide everything for us, this and that, guys. It does not mean lay down. It doesn't mean go to sleep. It means that God's already got it. Whatever it is, I'm going to go forth knowing that God's already got it for me. Brother Larry got a new truck, two of them in one day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and so what it does then, guys, once you're careful and your and your spirit is filled in love, well then it, it causes a, a, a believer to have what they call a domestic uh, uh, relationship. All of a sudden, if I'm filled with that love, what can I live towards Christine? Regardless of what she might bring to me, what can I live to towards Christy? Love. Love of God. You're filled with it. You're filled with it. You're not filled with anything else. You're filled with that. And so, it, then all of a sudden, uh, you want to talk about domestic relationship? 
What about husbands and wives? Why are you breaking me up? <laughs> I don't know a bit of that this morning, honey. I'm sorry, baby. <laughs> You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you waking me up? Why this? Why that? <laughs> Hold on a minute. If we're filled in that love of God, guys, listen, I don't know why, but we don't have to live there for a minute. Well, now, you know, we have this uh, relationship and we want you to have, we want another to have that relationship. I don't know why I did that. Go look in the mirror. <laughs> I mean, it takes a I mean, in its perspective, that would sound hateful as it could be to somebody that didn't hear that type of message. It would, it would seem very hateful if you said, well, I don't know why I'm that way. Go look in the mirror. Because who would they see? Jesus. Huh? Jesus. Well, they'd see themselves. Then they'd see themselves. <laughs> and you know, that would, that's why he says, be careful. Because they may not like it. I'm sure they won't. But it, it, it changes when all of a sudden you have that relationship with God and everything else, guys. It changes relationships between wives and, and, and husbands. It changes relationships between children and parents. It changes relationships between servants and masters. And Jesus was a master, but he humbled himself to the point of death so that you and I can have that peace. So you see how that, how it kind of, it works all in itself. It, 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 it's all there and it's all in the spirit, guys. And some people call this book of Ephesians the love book. And, you know, and, it, and it really can be if we could ever get the grasp of what it is that we're being taught. If we could just apply that. I, I am absolute that if you could apply it for one whole day, you would not want to go back to anything else. You wouldn't. You know, and you wouldn't want your servants and you wouldn't want the people who are in authority over you to have anything less than that. I don't want those guys that are I'm trying to teach and everything else to have anything less than what I've got that day. And I don't want my masters, the people who have authority over me, I don't want them to not have it either. I'm doing the best I can in the Spirit of God to love. I'm doing the best that I can to do the will of the Father. And so, you know, it's, it just, it's just showing all, and I'm giving you just an outline, guys. I am not trying to teach the whole thing. I'm just giving you an outline of what we're going to see in the spirit of the book of Ephesians. I haven't even touched the book of Ephesians. <laughs> you know, just the outline. And so what it shows in that domestic uh, relationships, and, and that means the ones that we're have to be around every day of our life, you know, it shows that, boy, it can change husband and wives. It can change parents and children. It can change children or, or uh, uh, servants and masters. It can change all that. And then, of course, the big one, the spiritual warfare. How do we get there? How can we live this? How, how is it that we're able to live this? Well, they all know it's by faith. But in order to have it, you have to have an ally. You have to have somebody with you, amen? amen. You've got to have somebody with you to be able to live this. And who, do you, who is the most important person you're going to have to have with you in order to live it? Jesus. God. Jesus. Holy Spirit. You have an ally. In the morning, you've got an ally, and it's God. And if he's for you, who can be against you? So, you have to have a partner. <laughs> and, and your partner's God. But also, in this warfare, a believer's warfare, you have to have an enemy just as well, amen? amen. Yeah. And we do have plenty of those. And, and that enemy is Satan and his forces. The forces that try to make you believe you're not with God. The forces that try to make you think that you can change something to be better in somebody else's eyes. But you are better, you are perfect in the eyes of God through faith in Jesus. It isn't getting any better. 
From there, it only gets worse. And that's the war that we have every day. You have, you have an ally that's with you, and then you have an enemy that's against you. It's not hard to tell which one's what. One produces peace, the other one just comes to destroy. You know? And if that's coming to destroy, uh, go ahead and go do what you got to do, but I am not living destroyed. I lived that. You know, and I've been set free from that. And I'm being encouraged in that in the household of God. And I've got God on my side on this. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to be hiding. I'm not trying to be somebody. I, I am, I've got a man on my side. And that man happens to be Jesus Christ, which gives me an ally uh, with God. That's where we're going to be, right? Yes. And so, you know, the old enemy and his forces trying to get you back and trying to throw you away, and, and here we come. How do we fight off the fiery darts? What's the next point? Staying in his word. That's because they put on the armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. You can't, you can't put on a portion of the armor of God. You have to put on the whole armor of God. You have to have that head. You have to have that breastplate. You have to have that shield. You have to have these feet shod in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to have those things. And that's, you know, that's the book of Ephesians. Uh, you know, you have to have... <coughs> you have to have your equipment. You have to have it. Without it, you're going to get crucified. I shouldn't say crucified. That was Christ. You're going to get, you're going to get hurt. I just put it like that. You're either going to get hurt emotionally, you're going to get hurt physically, you're going to get hurt spiritually. You're going to get hurt if you don't have the equipment. God gave us the best. And he gives you the best. And guys, that's, that's, that's one of the things that that Paul's trying to bring up in the book of Ephesians. And I, I can't see it any other way than it being a love book because it covers everything. It covers the redemption. It covers the, the, you know, the, the instructions of a believer's life. It, it shows how we're supposed to relate to our domestic relationships. It shows you know, how we're supposed to fight off in our spiritual warfare. Breaking the mirror, so to speak, is seven years of bad luck. But that's still better than an eternity of bad luck. And then everybody goes home and takes all their mirrors down. <laughs> and I need to be tough, yeah. So once again, you know, Paul's coming in here and, and the only thing that he's trying to do, guys, the only thing that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to see to it that we have uh, an ability to, to seek and strengthen our faith. It's him and him alone. Strengthen our faith and have a solid spiritual foundation. Well, how do you know that preacher's telling you the truth? I got God's word on it. I'm witness. I've got witnesses, you know. I've seen it for myself. I partake of that. And the only time that I have these problems is that that preacher's telling me the truth is if I don't live it the way he's telling me to live it. And I find myself miserable. You know, and, and guys, so so then so then in that, also in that, what is it what does it promote? What does it promote when all of a sudden you see that? The truth. Your need to come back. Unity. The unity. The need to be of that household. That you know, you need to be here. Because if you're not here, this year is going to get filled with something, guys. And if you're not here to hear that, 
then it's going to get filled with the only thing you got besides the Almighty God is going to get filled Same. with the enemy. And when I was a kid, I loved to fight. As I get older, I can't stand it. I don't like to fight at all. But if I'm going to fight, I'm going to fight the good fight. And I'm going to fight the good fight of faith all the way until God calls me home. And it will be good enough. And anyone that comes along, anyone that's able to walk that walk, just as we're being taught, guys, that's why I'm teaching it. It is because I want to be somebody standing up before you. I want you to have everything I have. I want people to say, you live in a utopia. You live in a la-la land. There is no way in the world that you can live like that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you can. And yes, you can. And the only thing that hinders us is the enemy. And in church, that's not who you are. They can't defeat you. There's nothing that can come along and defeat you or snatch you out of the hand of God. He's got you. He's got you forever. Uh, the seeds that are planted. I worry all the time about my grandkids kids, believe me, I do, you know, that they've heard, and because they've had to be around it all the time, all the time, all the time, it's like you're supposed to, to do, and this and that. I don't believe that. I raised the daughter, and she wants to be around me. She's living in its fullness, that right before my own eyes. She can do a lot of things to me, but that right there supersedes everything that I've ever seen. That lifts that up and the rest of it, and it disappears. It ain't it real? You know? An ounce of Jesus is worth a pound of cure. Let's see if I've missed anything else. One of the special features of the book of Ephesians that Paul brings up here, there's five of them, but one of the special ones is the unfolding of the theological truth. The unfolding. All of a sudden, I didn't know that, and all of a sudden, God unfolded it to me of the theological, God's truth. And that's, that's really what the book of Ephesians is doing. It's taken and it's unfolding the theological God's truth, the Word of God. And, it, and it's making it so that we can uh, see it. Uh, and it is, uh, it, it is interpreted by only two of the most powerful uh, uh, things, and <laughs> that is the wisdom and the revelation of God uh, and the knowledge of God. The wisdom and the revelation of God. God says I can live it that way. You're going to tell me you can't? <laughs> I say it don't work. It started yesterday. <laughs> the second thing is. Uh, in Christ, it, it, it speaks about the weightiness of the, of, of the prominence of Christ. Guys, listen, that's the most powerful weightiness you could possibly have. As a lost person, it used to bother the daylights out of me to have somebody tell me they knew Jesus. And the reason it was is because I did and it became very heavy. And that's where we come back with where you're saying you're better than me. That wasn't what was being said even in my youth. That wasn't what was being said. They were trying to give me the opportunity to have what they had and I wasn't smart enough to hear it. I'm a little slow. 33 years slow, actually. <laughs> mother, 70 years. Seven years old before my mother really came to the realization that Jesus Christ was put on that cross for her. After that, 
That old girl was stern, and she was crumbly as she can be, but she cared about every single one of you here. And the evidence is, that, you know, the finances and all the backing that was there uh, while she was alive. And it's still there. And it will be. So, you know, there's just, you know, it doesn't really matter when you come to this, it's when you, when it's real. When it's really a part of it. Uh, there's a, a multiple facets of the enthusiast, uh, enthusiasm on the role of the Holy Spirit in a Christian's life, uh, sometimes regarding uh, as the twin epistles, the twin epistles being Colossians, uh, Ephesians and Colossians, they call that the twin epistles. It's kind of of the same letter. You can read it for yourself and look at it and you'll almost see that it's, it's one with another. It, it's just like, it's almost the same. And so they call it the twin apostle, uh, epistles uh, with Colossians because the two have uh, certain re resemblances and, and the contents is of the same. Uh, the outlines of the letters are basically the same to those two churches. And so that's, that's, that's pretty much uh, as good as I can give you as an outline and an introduction and a purpose of the book of Ephesians. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting a little more of the concrete into it uh, the next week, guys, as we follow along. And we start there in the first introduction with Paul. But now you have some idea of what, what's, what's taking place in the book of Ephesians. And I like to do that. I always like to do that because then you have an idea. Oh, yeah, I remember when he said that. Oh, yeah, I remember when the Spirit showed me this. Oh, yeah. And if I don't do it, I just jump off in there and it. you'll be like, well, what is he trying to say? Or what is it the Spirit's trying to say to me? You know, you clearly got an outline of what, what's going to take place in the next few weeks or months or whatever it is that God sees fit. Uh, questions? Comments? Nothing? Good. Don't forget to look in the mirror. <laughs> I did do that, David. Did you? <laughs> Very good. I love every one of you. God loves you. Let us go forth and let us live as the children of God. And, and you know, we got a warfare, but you've already won the victory in Jesus Christ. You've already won that victory. Don't let something drag you off and make you look good. Amen? Amen. Let's go, Father. Father, once again, I just give you great thanks for the words of your wisdom and, and just the assurance of your spirit, Father. Just knowing that if we could just get up and even taste a glimpse of what you shared tonight as an outline, Lord, that boy, it would enlighten our hearts and it would enlighten our minds and it would enlighten those that are around us, Father, to live it, you know, other than, you know, missing out on you. Father, I wish this class was clear full. I really do because... It is such an instrument that you used in my life that I can share as an example for those around us. Father, once again, I thank you in all things, and I surely thank you for your spirit this evening. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Love you all.